shorter than that would be good and we will have more time for questions. Perfect, great. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this. I'm delighted to be back uh, at the Princeton Bucharest seminar um, where I've been periodically for many years. It's been a very important part of my life for a number of reasons. Um, and so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to be speaking today in a sort of hybrid format, uh, both uh, extemporaneous um, uh, 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 explanations as well as reading a written text. I do hope it will be fluid uh, and I apologize in advance if there are some rough spots. This is a, a, a a work in progress uh, that emerges out of the work that I've been doing for a few years now uh, in collaboration with Stephen Men. Uh, we have recently published with OUP an edition of the two uh, philosophical dissertations written by the African philosopher Anton Wilhelm Amo uh, in Germany in the 1730s. Working on Amo got me interested in a couple of things. First of all, uh, the intellectual context at the University of Halle in the early 18th century where Amo was active and Halle is also the home of a number of luminary figures including notably Christian Wolff and Christian Tomasius. And it also got me interested in another character named Jacobus Capitain who is uh, often paired with Amo because he is the other prominent uh, Ghanaian uh, intellectual active in Europe in the early 18th century in the Netherlands as opposed to Germany, but still in certain important respects, Amo's and Capitaine's respective life paths are uh, unfold in parallel. So I've been translating Capitaine's uh, primary work, his dissertation of 1742, and trying to trace back the intellectual uh, genealogy in which he inscribes himself. And much to my surprise, although Capitaine is writing from Amsterdam and as a theologian, in the Dutch Reformed Church, he's also uh, writing uh, in very intimate connection with various uh, jurisprudential debates going on in Halle among figures we know Amo to have had direct contact with. So I'm looking at this uh, intellectual field uh, that includes both Capitan and Amo uh, and contemporaneously with Amo at the University of Halle, Christian Tomasius, and also as an important figure in the background whose name will not be new to any of you, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. So I'm trying to sketch out that field today. Uh, now, I wanted to start with uh, probably the most scandalous and difficult material uh, that we'll be considering today, and it will only gradually become clear why I want to look at this, and it's Leibniz's addendum or appendix to the famous Concilium Aegyptiacum of 1671 that Leibniz writes when he's very young, several decades before Amo is born or Capitaine. Uh, and it's meant, uh, the Concilium Aegyptiacum is meant as a kind of uh, proposal sent to Louis XIV uh, to convince him effectively to uh, invade uh, Egypt. Now, the uh, appendix that Leibniz writes to uh, the Concilium Aegyptiacum in 1671 is bolder still. It's entitled, A Method for Instituting a New Invincible Militia that Can Subjugate the Entire Earth 
easily seize control over Egypt or establish American colonies. So now conquering Egypt is just one of several uh, ambitious goals the young Leibniz has in mind. And he writes here, uh, I'll just go ahead and read, a certain island of Africa, such as Madagascar, shall be selected and all the inhabitants shall be ordered to leave. Visitors from elsewhere shall be turned away or in any event, it will be decreed that they only be permitted to stay in the harbor for the purpose of obtaining water. To this island, slaves captured from all over the barbarian world will be brought and from all of the wild coastal regions of Africa, Arabia, New Guinea, etc. To this end, Ethiopians, Negritians, Angolans, Caribbeans, Canadians, and Hurons fit the bill without discrimination. What a lovely bunch of semi-beasts, Leibniz writes. But so that this mass of men may be shaped in any way desired, it is useful only to take boys up to around the age of 12. Uh, now, a number of people have commented on this passage with uh, no small amount of shock and horror, and it is horrible. What I've noticed about this text uh, and what I think is important to kind of make sense of what Leibniz is thinking about here is first of all, we know that he read uh, the uh, description of the Canary Islands that had been published uh, uh, a few years earlier in the history of the Royal Society edited by, edited by Thomas Spratt. And he's interested in using the model of the Spanish colonial conquest of the new world, which set out as it were from the Canary Islands. Leibniz wants effectively to do the same, but with another island off of Africa. And in effect, this is advice that the French empire will end up taking, but 200 or so years later, right? Uh, uh, an interesting kind of uh, postscript to this. Now, the other important fact is something I noticed in the marginal notes that Leibniz himself writes on this appendix to uh, the uh, uh, Concilium Aegyptiacum. Uh, and uh, it, uh, the, the, the note reads as follows, Janissaries, Circassians, description of the peak of Tenerife in the history of the Royal Society. So that uh, note, I think, is key to understanding what's going on uh, in this uh, rather horrifying passage. Uh, and will be key to understanding also more or less everything that Tomasios and Capitain have to say about uh, the institution of slavery. Their paradigm case of the institution of slavery is not transatlantic chattel slavery, but rather the figure of the Janissary in the Ottoman Empire, which is something very different for a number of reasons that we're going to see. Among them, it's an institution that enables quite a bit of social mobility for the person who is nominally a slave, including uh, 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 even uh, the possibility of leading a sovereign state as happens in Mamluk, Egypt. So let's just keep that in mind uh, as we go on to look now at something that Leibniz writes later on, uh, decades later, closer to the era of activity of Tomasius Amo and Capitain, uh, uh, that is called a, uh, a meditation on the common notion of justice. Um, this is a text that has been uh, interestingly discussed by Patrick Riley, not surprisingly, and also more, more recently in a very nice article by Julia Gerati uh, entitled Leibniz on Slavery and the Ownership of Human Beings from last year. And I think Julia is with us today. So uh, thank you, Julia, for, for, for that, 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 that very nice article. Uh, and what I'm going to be saying uh, about this work is much more cursory uh, and um, it's only on the way to understanding uh, the work of people other than Leibniz. So key to Leibniz's understanding of monadic domination, we're moving into uh, 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 philosophy gear here from uh, let's say jurisprudence and politics, 
key to Leibniz's understanding of monadic domination is that it is always contingent and temporary. No individual corporeal substance will remain subordinated to another eternally. There is no absolute domination, but only relative domination. Um, this aspect of Leibniz's theory of monadic domination, I contend, corresponds precisely to his conception of domination in the political sphere. Leibniz explains in the meditation of 1702 that, quote, the body of a man is the property of his soul and cannot be taken away from him for as long as he is alive. Taken out of context, this statement might appear to, to a scholar of Leibniz's thought to concern the metaphysical relation between body and soul. In fact, it occurs in connection with an argument about the injustice of slavery. For Leibniz, from the fact that a soul cannot be possessed by another absolutely, which in metaphysical rigor would mean that the possessing soul eternally perceives the possessed soul with a higher degree of clarity than the possessed soul perceives its own states, it follows that the body of one person cannot be possessed absolutely by someone else, which strictly speaking would be nothing other than for that other person's body to be a full and proper extension of the possessor's or dominator's body. Central to his argument against slavery is the belief that jus strictum, or law interpreted with utmost rigor, cannot serve as an adequate foundation of jurisprudence. Two further elements are required, Leibniz thinks. Equity, which softens the rigor of jus strictum, and piety, which ensures that civic law is applied in conformity with divine law. Leibniz therefore severely criticizes Thomas Hobbes for having stayed at the first level. For Leibniz, the right of acquisition is founded in jus strictum. And if we were to stop there with Hobbes, it would follow that the power that some people have over others, such as parents over children or masters over slaves, would become absolute and limitless. Leibniz deploys an example here from New World Ethnography, albeit one that is crudely inaccurate, in order to argue that both of these sorts of relation in the absence of equity and piety become indistinguishable from one another and can result, interestingly, given our principal concern here, uh, in the total appropriation of subordinated others through cannibalism. And of course, I have to mention Catalina Avramescu's wonderful work on the importance of thought experiments with cannibalism for uh, intellectual history of early modern Europe. And if we wish to stop at eustrictum alone, Leibniz writes, the American cannibals would be justified in eating their prisoners. There are those among them who go further. They make use of their female prisoners to have children, and then they fatten and eat these children and finally eat the mother when she cannot produce anymore. Such are the consequences of the supposed absolute right of masters over slaves and of fathers over children. So pretty extreme stuff. Such a scenario would amount in effect to the, the combination of political and uh, metaphysical domination. It would be an extreme instance of the master-slave relation in which the limit case of Use strictum results in total bodily appropriation. Arriving at this limit case, in turn, would come, it would come about that the dominated subject is now dominated as a constituent of the corporeal substance. Leibniz accepts that in a certain sense, children belong to their parents. And at least according to the law of nations, slaves belong to their masters in an analogous way. At the same time, he denies that the legal power that a master can have over a slave is in conformity with natural reason. And in fact, he considers that master-slave relations differ from the parent-child one in certain fundamental ways. Leibniz believes that even if the master-slave re relation were in conformity with natural reason, there would be limits in view of equity and piety to what a master could do to his slave. If I would admit, he writes, that there is a right of slavery among men that is in, in conformity with natural reason, and that according to you strictum, the bodies of slaves and their children are under the power of masters, 
it will still remain the case that another stronger right is opposed to the abuse of this right. This is the right of rational souls that are naturally and inalienably free. This is the right of God, who is the sovereign master of bodies and souls, and under whom masters are fellow citizens with their slaves. Since the latter have the right of citizenship in the kingdom of God, as much as the former do. At most, Leibniz believes that what a master can have in a slave then is not property, but rather only a sort of usufruct, an extremely limited usufruct at that, to the extent that it must be exercised, as he writes, salva re, so that the right could not go so far as to make the slave cruel or unhappy, even unhappy. It would be a peculiar sort of slavery indeed that required the master to see, the, see to the slave's happiness and moral well-being. And it's certainly not characteristic of transatlantic chattel slavery. It is highly improbable that the global slave economy could have been sustained for long as it was emerging in, in the early modern world if Leibniz's requirements had been taken seriously. So again, political domination can be understood as the power of an individual to constrain the bodies of others, to do one's own will, to make them in a certain sense extensions of one's own body to the extent that they are the executors, executors of one's own will. Leibniz does not say so explicitly, but it may be presumed that something like a greater degree, degree of perception underlies domination here too. Power is grounded in a more perspicacious grasp of the range of options for the motions of another person's body, a grasp which easily translates in the ability to control these motions. In the end, however, political subordination, including the extreme case of slavery, is not grounded in natural reason. And wherever there is subordination, there is a parallel order in which any two given individuals are perfectly equal and independent of one another while being dominated in exactly the same way by God. So there's an interesting story to tell though, the one we will only touch on tangentially here about the way Leibniz's theory of freedom and slavery may have influenced the legal thinking of the most prominent African thinker active in 18th century Germany, Anton Wilhelm Amo. Amo emerged from a nexus at Wolfenbüttel that seems to have been a classic instance of early enlightenment sensibilities within the German, nobili uh, German no nobility. Leibniz was a frequent visitor at Wolfenbüttel at the time that we know Amo was there as a child. Um, and at the same time, uh, Leibniz was entangled, as we also know, in a bitter controversy with the Halle pietist physician Georg Ernst Stahl, and was also giving shape to the nascent philosophical views of the young Christian Wolf. The boundaries between the pietists and the advocates of enlightenment in Protestant Germany in the early 18th century are by no means so clear as might appear from a superficial consideration of the commitments of the different schools of thought. By the time of Immanuel Kant's mature work, it will be clear that pietist influences can in fact be interwoven with enlightenment bona fides. And much the same possibility seems to have existed as early as the 1720s in Halle. One particularly important point of commonality is that the philosophers of the Leibnizian Wolfian enlightenment and the pietists alike were intently focused on the practical and theoretical project of promoting uh, Protestant missionary activity in the extra European world. This project in turn stimulated interest in the early development of ethnography and comparative linguistics. Han Vermeulen has written about uh, this chapter of the German Enlightenment very well, and also turned the main Lutheran universities in Germany into destinations for non-European students and scholars from around the world. And also, finally, made the legal status of these people within Europe into a topic of sustained interest and research. The University of Wittenberg, 
had been founded in 1502 by Friedrich the Wise of Saxony. Nearly from the beginning, it became the center of intellectual life in Protestant Germany, with Martin Luther himself joining the Faculty of Theology in 1512. Philippe Melanchthon served a term as the rector in the academic year 1523-24 and played an important role in promoting the development of a new Lutheran natural philosophy amenable to Aristotle, notwithstanding Luther's own radical rejection of non-biblical traditions. The University of Halle was in turn founded in 1694 by the Margrave Friedrich III of Brandenburg, and from the beginning, there was close communication, but also political tension and rivalry with Wittenberg, nearby, but on the other side of the Prussian-Saxon border. The University of Halle was from its foundation particularly valuable for the Prussian state in the training of civil servants in the emerging Cameralist system of 18th century Germany. In large part for this reason, special importance was placed on the law faculty there, which was originally centered around its star professor, Christian Tomasius, the son of Leibniz's mentor, Jakob Tomasius. Tomasius, the junior, perhaps best known for his enlightened writings on witch trials, was also an important node for the introduction of the legal philosophy of Grotius and Samuel Pufendorf at Halle. And finally, like many of his contemporaries in the Halle Law Faculty, many of whom taught courses followed by Amo, Tomasius wrote and lectured extensively on slavery. A few words about Amo before we move on to him because he's not our primary interest today. Amo's first work, generally presumed lost, is the legal dissertation entitled On the Right of Moors in Europe, defended in November 1729. According to a contemporaneous summary of the work by Johann Peter von Ludwig, Amo, quote, showed from laws and histories that the kings of the Moors were enfiefed under the Roman emperor and that each of them had to obtain a royal patent from him, which Justinian also issued. Amo's evidence for this and ours uh, via the summary comes from Procopius's account of Justinian's reconquest of North Africa in the Vandalic War of the early sixth century. We know that the person who summarized Amo's dissertation, uh, Johann Peter von Ludwig himself, as well as Simon Peter Gasse, had both lectured on Justinian in the law faculty at Halle earlier in 1729, and that von Ludwig had that year sent to press a book on the life of Justinian and Justinian's uh, wife Theodora and his legal advisor Tribonian, defending them against calumnies and above all, defending the status of Justinian's corpus juris civilis in contemporary German law. Uh, the Wöchentliche Hallische Frage und Ansagungsnachrichten of September 26, 1729, so two months before the summary of Amo's uh, dissertation by Johann Peter von Ludwig, indicates that, and I quote, in the law faculty, Herr Chancellor von Ludwig explains the Institutiones Juris of Justinian and intends first to discuss the foundations of Roman law and then to derive German laws from authoritative documents and sources. So this is all a lot of detail, but I, I, I present it to show you that it's plausible to suppose that Amo was present at these lectures just two months before his own defense of his legal dissertation and that Amo's concern to derive the current legal situation of Moors, quote unquote, in Europe from ancient Roman sources was at least in part influenced by what he had learned in the lecture hall from von Ludwig. So von Ludwig's summary of Amo's legal dissertation seems to imply that to the extent that ancient Roman law continues to be a source of law in the, in the Holy Roman Empire, Justinian's establishment of feudal law in Africa has some bearing on our understanding of the legal, legal status 
of at least some Africans in modern Germany. It does not seem to matter for this argument that the reconquest of Africa in 533 only managed to gain control of the northernmost coastline of the continent. And even here, there were almost immediately insurrections uh, uh, that sufficiently destabilized the Roman governments to, to the point that it was a mere theoretical construct. How then this construct was supposed to have extended across the Sahara to, uh, uh, to Guinea, where Amo comes from, uh, 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 and to remain binding there over a millennium is not clear. Nonetheless, the summary suggests that Amo is not simply giving a blanket argument against slavery, as is sometimes thought. It may be that he's seeking to show that laws that might bind some African to a particular lord are the same as those governing the obligations of serfs under feudal law in Europe uh, and in some parts of Europe into Amo's day under the ultimate protection of Roman law and of the emperor as the guardian of law. But we don't know what he said. No one uh, knows the exact contents of the dissertation any more than what I've just summarized for you. We do know very well, by contrast, what Amo's countrymen, the Ghanaian theologian Jacobus Capitain, uh, said on the topic of slavery. Unlike Amo, we also have a, uh, several portraits of Capitain. Um, this one, if you can. Uh, read Dutch, uh, identifies him as an African Moor uh, and invites you to look at this Moor. His skin is black, but his soul is white, which is a very common uh, 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 phrase, variations thereupon in a, a misplaced uh, 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 early modern European uh, what you might call philo-Africanism. Um, so we know what uh, Capitaine had to say about slavery. Brought to the Netherlands in 1729, in 1737, Capitaine enrolled in the Faculty of Theology at the University of Leiden, where he completed his dissertation uh, entitled uh, On uh, Slavery, uh, Not uh, Contrary uh, to uh, 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 Christian freedom uh, in 1742. And this was published in Dutch uh, uh, by a translator. Capitaine wrote in Latin. It was translated into Dutch by someone else and published in the same year. Capitaine, while avoiding straightforward autobiography, nonetheless makes it clear that simply in virtue of his arrival in the Netherlands from Africa, uh, rather than in a colony of the Netherlands in the Americas, he is ipso facto not a slave. Thus he notes that, uh, uh, quote, slavery is unknown in the Netherlands as it is not permitted here to cast anyone into servitude. And in fact, on the contrary, any slave who arrives here from elsewhere and thereafter resides among the Dutch uh, and much more who duly embraces the Christian religion as if by silent agreement is granted his bodily freedom so that he can no longer be sold or transferred in, in accordance with the will of a master. Here Capitaine is largely paraphrasing a 1668 work of the Dutch legal scholar Paulus Vogt, who writes in his commentary on the four books of the imperial institutions that, and I quote, this is a long quote, but I think it's worth uh, giving you all of it. The United Netherlands, after they obtained their freedom by right and by arms, have such a strong abhorrence to the law of slavery that if slaves should arrive among us from elsewhere or should cross the boundaries of our territory, by this very fact they obtain their freedom, like Capitaine claims he himself does. So that many have settled in the United Netherlands who were accepted into our dominion and likewise into safety and protection nor are they returned to those from whom they escaped. Vogt goes on to acknowledge that there is some residual slavery in parts of Europe, surviving from the feudal era, but that it is largely disappearing. Vestiges remain, Vogt writes, of a certain original slavery in Germany, Poland, Muscovy, Transylvania, Prussia, as well as in the regions of Zutphen and Velva in the Netherlands. And shortly thereafter, he adds, in the Kingdom of England, 
With hard slavery having been eliminated, some are still compelled to work in the mines. Others work like slaves for a certain time according to an agreement who are called apprentices. So this is, as, you, as you're seeing, a description of slavery in a rather wide sense, a sense that goes far beyond, um, again, uh, what is typically called chattel slavery. So although we have in Capitaine an implicit argument to the effect that he himself is not a slave, it is noteworthy that he never once mentions Africa or the transatlantic slave trade in his work. Some scholars have contrasted Amo and Capitaine on the question of slavery, portraying the former as an anti-slavery thinker and the latter as a pro-slavery thinker. But this is misguided for at least two reasons. One is that understood correctly, Capitaine is arguing neither for nor against slavery. He is rather arguing conditionally that given the existence of slavery, there is no good argument for withholding baptism from slaves. Second, given the brief description by von Ludewig that we've seen of Amo's work, and given the abundance of Halle based sources for Capitaine's work, which we're going to consider momentarily, it seems reasonable to suppose that both Amo and Capitaine were in fact drawing their arguments from the same broad intellectual context, offering largely the same range of argumentative strategies. This context and these offerings were primarily oriented by a conception of slavery that did not distinguish it from the forms of servitude familiar from antiquity and surviving still in parts of Europe. The terms consistently used by Capitaine are servitus, which may be translated either as slavery or as servitude, and servus, either slave or servant. To the extent that they were concerned with African slavery, they were interested in understanding how the laws governing the slave status of some Africans, but not evidently themselves, developed out of precedents established in the ancient Mediterranean world and subsequently in medieval Northern Europe. There may also be considerable self-censorship in both cases, we can't rule that out. It seems implausible that Capitan in particular uh, in his extant treatise, did not have his fellow Africans in mind when he wrote about the historical institutions of slavery in Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean. Whether he was simply following scholarly norms and precedents by sticking to the example of, examples of slavery also invoked by Tomasius and others, or whether he was consciously avoiding mention of anything that might come across to readers and peers as too close to home is a question that is difficult to answer. But perhaps we can go some way towards answering it by looking at the way in which Capitaine inserts himself in the contemporary debates emerging out of Hala, and in particular the way he responds to Tomasius's key arguments about slavery. Like any good modern Dutch thinker, Capitaine has little patience for Aristotle. And unsurprisingly, he rejects Aristotle's account of natural slavery. In chapter two of his work on slavery, on the primordial origins of slavery, Capitaine sets out to show, quote, its use among practically all nations, unquote. Yet wherever we find it, we find that it emerges not from innate inequality, Capitaine thinks, but from the circumstances of war and domination. Every mortal, he writes, quote, according to the law of nature is subject to his own right. That is the common situation of primordial men permitted to them an equal liberty, which is rightly granted by learned men as beyond the risk of doubt. At issue is the fact that in our origin, we are all the same, Capitan writes. From here, moreover, the thorny argument of Aristotle concerning natural slavery, which held that in this natural state, differences among men were acknowledged, and thus that by nature, the one man is free while the other is born a slave, which is either to joke in a serious matter 
or is that, or it is at once to give off a whiff of the arrogance of the peripatetic sect in this sort of thing, and to do so very open." End of quote. Capitaine takes somewhat seriously the legend of Ham uh, and the Hamitic tribe, according to which one of the sons of Noah is punished for his betrayal uh, uh, through a condemnation of all of his descendants to slavery. This myth would be marshaled, as you may know, in 19th century racist defenses of slavery, particularly in the United States. But interestingly, Capitaine makes no mention of the part of darker skin color, uh, makes no mention of darker skin color as being part of the punishment, but only condemnation to slavery. And even this does not count as natural slavery in Aristotle's sense since it has a, a, a starting point in history and can be traced back to its uh, contingent causes, Ham's transgression. If it goes against Christian doctrine to believe that human beings are unequal among themselves, it is no less a misunderstanding of this doctrine to suppose that adherence to it, including new adherence through conversion, might be enough to bring about political equality. Human beings are equal in their souls, Capitaine thinks, but recognizing this equality has no direct liberatory implications whatsoever. And this much is established, Capitaine thinks, by the endurance of the institution of slavery among early Christians. He is surprisingly firm on this point. So many men in the Netherlands, he writes, wish to persuade themselves and others with whom they speak that Christian liberty can in no way stand alongside slavery. This stupid and inane opinion of our adversaries would never have won over any minds if they had not formed, I don't know what manner of preposterous ideas about the nature of the social arrangement of the New Testament, if they were not ignorant of the customs of the ancient Christians and of their ancient religions and institutions and the traditional practices of their princes." End of quote. If there is any practical consequence of spiritual freedom for the earlier Christians, it is that it lifts from them what Capitaine calls the yoke of the ceremonial law. A Jewish slave may become a Christian slave and in so doing be freed from the Old Testament strictures on conduct without for that uh, reason being liberated from his obligation to labor for his master. Baptism can save a person from what Capitaine calls, quote, slavery of conscience, but not from civil slavery. The right of heaven, as he writes, implies no rights in the, quote, law court. Capitaine's range of references is very broad, much broader than Amos. He cites the Cambridge Platonist Henry Moore as an authority on Christian freedom. He cites the church fathers such as Gregory of Nyssa and Clement of Alexandria. He cites Calvin. He cites a number of Halle scholars, as I've indicated, on feudal law in Germany, including Anton Wilhelm Amo's mentor, Johann Peter von Ludwig, whom I've already cited. And he, like Leibniz, and as we'll see, Thomasius as well, cites a number of scholarly works on the Ottoman Empire. One of Capitaine's favorite sources on Ottoman institutions and history, who was also frequently cited by Leibniz, was the 16th century French diplomat and traveler, Augier Ghislain de Busbec, who published in 1581 the remarkable Iter Constantinopolitanum, subsequently appearing in numerous demotic forms in various languages under the title Turkish letters or its variant. Uh, if anyone is looking for a full throttle defense of slavery by appeal to the benefits it had supposedly brought to the Ottomans, Buzbek will not disappoint. He's also operating, Buzbek is operating within the same optic we might also know from early modern French theater, uh, such as Racine's Bajazet of 1672, which permits the playwright to set a, tra set a tragedy in the contemporary world, so long as its events unfold in a neighboring empire, since the Ottoman world is seen as a sort of time capsule passed down to the present day from antiquity. 
and thus in a certain respect as an echo of Rome. Husbeck writes, and I'm sorry, I have to read this whole quote in full because it's so rich. Um, I think it's the last long quote in my talk. I have my doubts as to whether the man who first abolished slavery, and incidentally, this entire quote from Busbeck is given uh, in Capitaine, uh, in buttressing his own argument. I have my doubts as to whether the man who first abolished slavery is to be regarded as a public benefactor. I know that slavery brings with it various disadvantages, but these are counterbalanced by corresponding advantages. If a just and mild form of slavery, such as the Roman law ordained, especially with the state for master, had continued, perhaps fewer gallows and gibbets would be needed to keep those in order who, having nothing but life and liberty, are driven by want into every conceivable crime. Freedom, when combined with extreme poverty, has made many a man a rascal. It causes temptation such as few can resist. Both publicly and privately, the Turks derive great advantages from this institution. Slave labor enables them to live both comfortably and economically. Indeed, they have a proverb to the effect that no one can be considered poor as long as he is master of a single slave. So also in the Department of Public Works, if there is any building removing, clearing, or breaking up to be done, there's a constant supply of slave labor to execute the work. We never attained the grandeur of the works of antiquity here in Europe. What is the reason? Hands are wanting, or in other words, slave labor. I need not mention what, uh, what means of acquiring every kind of knowledge the ancients possessed in learned and educated slaves. Now I wanna emphasize that last part of, of, of the quote. In this last part, Buzbek is invoking the figure of the Mamluk a powerful military and knightly class of slaves uh, uh, in many Muslim societies who frequently held important military and administrative duties. It's clear, though I can't go into detail on this uh, aspect of the topic today, that African court servants or Hofmoren in early modern Germany and Central and Eastern Europe were generally modeled on the Mamluks. And the tasks they were given in the court and in society reflected, if in a somewhat ceremonialized and orientalist fashion, the role Mamluks were thought to have in Muslim states. Thus the Nigerian Angelo Soliman was described in his lifetime, both as a slave and as a noble of the court of Vienna. In Russia, Peter the Great's slave Avram Ganibal became a high ranking military officer. And Amo himself led military parades for visiting delegations of royals at Halle. So slavery in early 18th century Germany, in short, was reflected far more through the lens of the Ottoman and Muslim worlds than through the lens of transatlantic chattel slavery. And while Spanish, French, and English authors had already been debating for over 200 years the theological and political consequences of the baptism of indigenous and African peoples in the Americas, in parts of Europe that still had vestiges of feudalism and that did not have significant colonial presences in the Americas, the question of manumission appeared to have uh, appeared to be one that might be resolved by appeal to ancient precedent in Roman law and in scripture. From the Atlantic context, one might cite the Valladolid debate from the 1550s in Spain on the souls of Native Americans or the infamous Code Noir of the French colonies, which in 1685 made it compulsory that all African slaves subject to the French crown be baptized in the Catholic church. Capitaine mentions none of these precedents on the relationship between baptism and manumission. His pre preferred source, rather, as I've, we've been anticipating, and which I'll run through very briefly in the interest of time, is Christian Tomasius, who in 1693 published a short reply in a series of common questions to a work written four years earlier by a certain Johannes Christianus Kunink entitled on manumission of Turkish slaves resulting from baptism. This was of course only six years after the Battle of Vienna in 1683. And the practical problem of what to do with Turkish prisoners of war was a real one. 
Capitaine uh, bemoans Koenig's work, quote, that academic disputation which was thrust upon the Christian world under the title on manumission of the Turkish slaves. And he quickly adds, Capitaine quickly adds that, quote, the very celebrated and luminous man, Christian Tomasius, correctly exposed this disputation as false and repudiated it in the eighth of his common questions. Tomasius' argument in this work anticipates Capitaine's in clear ways. In particular, he argues from precedent, which is typical in the faculty of law at Halle as, well, as elsewhere. He argues from precedent, noting, first of all, uh, that there is no record of manumission through baptism in Roman law. And second of all, that the early Christians were who were far more charitable than we are, did not think to abolish slavery. So a fortiori manumission can be no requirement of baptism in our own time. Tomasius is typically seen as a paragon of German enlightenment thought in view of his pleas for toleration of heretical views, notably those of witches, but also those of so-called infidels. Yet part of his spirit of toleration is grounded in a low appreciation of the power of language and gesture to convey the state of a person's soul, and thus a certain skepticism about the meaningfulness of conversion. In his 1697 work entitled, Is Heresy a Crime? Tomasius comes forth as a hero of religious freedom, so much so that the relatively enlightened Leibniz feels, com Leibniz feels compelled to criticize what he sees as Tomasius' excessive spirit of toleration. In this work in dialogue, through the mouthpiece of the character identified only as the Christian, Tomasius notes that, quote, repentance and conversion, which are both works of the will, have become intellectual objects for our orthodoxy. In fact, they are often not even intellectual objects, but mere sounds without meaning. When someone from the Papist, Judaic, or Turkish religion comes across to us, he is called a convert. Yet he changes his life not in the least, altering only the formulas and creed on his lips. Often such people do not even understand the grammatical meaning of the words they learn by heart. Now, uh, to move towards a conclusion, Capitaine is himself a convert and one who surely would not wish to be suspected of harboring any reservatio mentalis. Capitaine is also, unlike Tomasius, writing far from Central Europe, indeed at the heart of a country with a significant Atlantic empire. He himself was brought to the Netherlands by Arnold Steinhardt, a captain of the Dutch West Indies Company which was particularly active in the era in transporting slaves from the Gold Coast to Suriname. One such victim of the slave trade was Amo's brother. Capitaine could not but know that by the early 18th century, slavery was not primarily an Ottoman institution or an academic matter for scholars of Roman history and law. In this respect, his silence must be taken as significant. Given that Capitaine and Amo were both immersed in the same jurisprudential scholarship emerging out of Halle and other German Protestant universities, moreover, it is likely that if we were to be able to recover Amo's lost legal dissertation, that we would find it to be of similarly theoretical and backward looking character, rather than what we, we might call an activist intervention in the scholarly debate demanding as yet unrecognized rights for himself. This said, it is important for historians of philosophy and legal thought to appreciate that well into the 18th century, debates about slavery could be conducted in abstraction from the realities of the Atlantic world and without any mention of the racialization and thus naturalization of divisions between slaves and non-slaves without any overt or conscious return to Aristotelianism, modern racialized slavery in the Atlantic world affirms in a new way the ancient idea of the natural slave. And this is something that Capitaine utterly rejects. However disappointing his partial defense of slavery might be, 
Capitaine, like Leibniz and indeed like Tomasius, believes that domination is an elim ineliminable part of political reality and indeed of the natural order, but he also believes that the domination of any particular moral subject by another is always contingent and reversible. His apology for political inequality may make him unsuitable for canonization by today's standards, yet it coexists in his work as it also does in Leibniz's with a metaphysics and a theology of spiritual equality and of the unity of the human species. And this is surely something not to be dismissed or forgotten. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Let, uh, me, let me try to find you all. I'll stop share. Okay, yeah, there you are. <laughs> try to stop share. Good, wonderful. Okay, so we, we open the question and answer session. Um, oh my goodness, I see there's a whole bunch of... Um, there, there is a whole bunch of philological... Yes, that's the pronunciation of Dutch. Sorry, <laughs> bird, bird, bird. <laughs> right, so that can also go on the mainstream, but if there are other questions, I think they we should probably come, uh, come first. So who wants to begin? Of course, I'm always happy to just, I, I, there was a lot of material in there, a lot of names and dates and details, and I'm always happy to just go back over and clarify anything that might have gone too fast. Right, so questions, interventions, requests for clarifications. Uh, Dolores has a question. Okay, Dolores. Can I see Dolores? If Claudia oh. can find her. Okay. Dolores, your microphone I is on. I see her, on. yeah. Uh, please, okay, so. can, you, can I ask everyone to, first of all, turn on your cameras? And also uh, announce your questions in the chat so that we can uh, find out who is where and Claudia can find you uh, on, the, on the screen. Dolores, please. So Justin, thanks for a, a um, wonderful talk. Um, I wondered if you could um, elaborate on the point of um, natural slaves um, mm. and connect that to your work on um, the indigenous. Um, mm -hmm. So because th that's... Um, I mean that the work you're doing is 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 is, uh, I mean it's not unique. Other people write about it, but the way mm -hmm. you're thinking about that in a kind of network of um, questions that actually originates in in um, ideas about what a human being is in Greek philosophy and what sure. what kind of powers uh, um, different kinds of human beings have. So I mean it it, it relates to women as well, but the mm -hmm. idea of being a natural slave is different from from being, um, you know, a subhuman or a um, or a, a woman or a child. So I wondered mm -hmm. if you could um, talk a little bit about um, the qualities of natural slavery and how that um, how that transforms that kind of question gets transformed in the recovery of. Of um, of Aristotle and, and and other Greek philosophers who also talk about um, natural slavery. Oh yeah, that's so interesting. Thanks so much. Um, goodness, I, first of all, I have to say I'm I'm seeing for the first time so many familiar faces that I didn't see before the talk, and now I'm a bit intimidated and overwhelmed by 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 y'all's presence. Um, um, but uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, in my 2015 book, uh, Nature, Human Nature, and Human Difference, um, uh, I uh, devote one chapter to the 16th century Ibero-American debates um, on, in particular, the uh, uh, origins of uh, the Native Americans. Um, and it's not just, it's not just uh, uh, Spanish or Spanish colonial authors who are writing about this, but also figures like Grotius, um, uh, 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 just for example, Matthew Hale. Um, and uh, in that context, uh, the um, uh, 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 Aristotelian background is uh, 
overwhelming. You cannot uh, engage with the question of the, uh, let's say, the, the status of the Native Americans, whether they're descended from Adam and Eve uh, 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 in particular, or whether as 16th century libertine thinkers thought they are uh, sprung from the earth to speak with, um, to speak with Lucilio Vanini or Giordano Bruno. Um, uh, in that context, uh, there is always uh, an invocation of um, Aristotle's theory of natural slavery. But if you, if you go and you look at the passages in the politics where Aristotle um, invokes the idea of natural slavery, one of the big problems with it and the reason why it was capable of sustaining so much debate is that Aristotle is not terribly clear on what groups of people he has in mind. He doesn't think, Aristotle doesn't think that barbarians as such are uh, naturally more suited to slavery than Greeks. Um, and he explicitly says that, uh, that the, the enslavement of prisoners of war, say of barbarian prisoners of war taken by Greeks in war, that's not natural slavery. That's just contingent slavery. Um, and uh, so, so, so as far as nations go, uh, or what in the modern period would start to be called uh, races, uh, it's not at all clear uh, that Aristotle thinks that whole kind of uh, biogeographical uh, 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 sections of humanity are naturally more suited to slavery than others. Again, not barbarians, not Ethiopians, um, um, no particular group. With women, and this is uh, kind of getting back to another part of your question, uh, uh, obviously we know uh, Aristotle's um, gender ideology, and there it's clear that he does think that women are naturally dominated by men. Naturally, that is to say, not contingently or by, by circumstances like kidnapping or something like that. Interestingly, and this is a point that I wanted to bring up in the talk, one of the things that I'm finding in um, kind of surveying, obviously I, have, I haven't had time to read uh, more than a handful, but surveying the titles of dissertations in the law faculty at Halle, uh, contemporaneous with Amo and Tomasius and von Ludwig, there are many, many, many dissertations on uh, what you might call family law, right? That is whether, uh, whether wives um, have the legal right to conduct business for households, things like that. Uh, those are almost as common as treatises on um, on, on, on slavery, as dissertations on slavery. And um, uh, it's not surprising here, uh, as we saw with Capitaine's reference to Aristotle in these uh, 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 Hala legal dissertations on the rights of women, um, there is universal uh, 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 rejection of, um, of the Aristotelian hierarchization of, uh, of the genders. Um, so I, I, could go, I could go on and on about this, but I, in, in a way I think Capitan gives us the best, um, uh, the best idea of the status of, um, uh, of Aristotle's theory of natural slaves, at least uh, within the uh, Protestant world, which again, includes Capitaine himself in the Dutch Reformed Church and also includes um, Amo and Tomasius uh, and Leibniz himself in, um, uh, in, the, in the Lutheran world. Um, they reject uh, 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 absolutely um, uh, any uh, attempt to uh, impose a natural hierarchy of human beings. But again, uh, even without a natural hierarchy of human beings, you can still have a defense of the institution of slavery, as indeed we see in um, in Capitaine. So I'll just end up there. Just, just, just to follow up. So, do, do we think that Aristotle's a notion of um, natural slavery comes from Herodotus, or mm. where is the um, because? 
um, he, he speaks of it so definitively as yeah. if it's already an established, um, well-established idea. And I just wondered um, if, if you place, place that hmm. within the context of Herodotus's history, because Herodotus is, has no problem categorizing different races as, as yeah. being X, Y, or Z. So there's a kind of, there's already in Herodotus an idea that a race um, has a certain set of characteristics. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not really an expert on this, but of course, you know, in Herodotus, you get also um, uh, the kind of whole um, array of um, semi-mythical humanoid yeah. beings yeah. as well, um, satyrs and, um, and 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 so on, um, for which Aristotle has very little patience, right? Um, for Aristotle, you're human or you're not, <laughs> um, and and if you're human, then you might be a barbarian. But you know, Aristotle has this wonderful line elsewhere in the Politics. I know, sorry, it's not in the Politics; it's in the Physics, but it's revealing. Um, you know. Um, uh, fire burns in Persia as it burns in Greece, meaning, you know, come on in the end, even if two nations are cut off from one another, they're still subject to the same physical laws of nature and therefore, um, you know, are going to come out in the end, basically, as sharing in the same nature, human nature. Okay, thank right. you. Um, we, have a, we have a list of questions now. So mm. I'm inviting some by people raising hands. I think Itzhak first and then Karin. Itzhak. Oh, hi, Yitzhak. You have to turn on your mic and maybe Claudia can find. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, hey. Great to see you. Uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. And, and you know, it's a complex story and, and it's fun that it's a complex story. Uh, so I'll, I'll try. So here's, uh, I have a few questions, but also some, um, some, um, uh, comments that I think are related more to the role of religion in this story. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, I, you, you, so let, let's begin with one or two points. I mean, so first of all, with regard to the Yenichers uh, and the text that the first text of Leibniz that you mentioned, I mean, mm -hmm. so part of the story of the Yenichers was uh, that they were supposed to be Christian children that were kidnapped and mm -hmm. made to Muslims. So there was an important element of just bringing them out into a just reborn Muslims. Mm -hmm. house, yeah. Right? That's a, uh, so what Leibniz is also thinking about uh, around, uh, uh, around these categories. And the other thing there is also that, if I'm not mistaken, again, I, I, it's a long time since I studied these topics, but my recollection was that the whole idea of the Yenchers was in some way trying to, um, uh, to implement platonic ideas. Mm -hmm. right? you know, yeah. Uh, Children that are going to that are going to be uh, detached from the, the guardians that will be yeah. detached from their families and will be just devoted to the state and this, and, and and whatever their uh, society or something like that. So was that part of the plan of Leibniz in that sense? I mean, what, do you think that also for him it was some sort of an echo of Platonic political ideas? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, I don't think Leibniz has anything that elaborate in mind. Um, he uh, uh, has read at that time, and he's only 26 years old, he's read at that time a single book by an Italian author called um, Il Ottomano, um, and I don't know uh, uh, beyond that how uh, well informed he was about, say, the history and origins of Ottoman institutions. That said, you're absolutely right that the institution of the Janissaries, it's extremely, let's say, um, unjust from the point of view of uh, good liberal Democrats like ourselves. Um, but you're right that it has this long pedigree uh, going back ultimately to Plato's Republic. Um, and you can see um, um, the, um, the class of the Janissaries as a sort of um, uh, 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 highly specialized guardian class or something like that, uh, that is torn from its parents and then um, in effect mm -hmm. brainwashed. Um, uh, uh, but an another nicer way to, to put that term is to say that they're reborn um, 
and embody entirely the values of the state, right? Um, and I don't know this history well, uh, but I have at least read and am familiar with the idea that there is a kind of continuous line of reflection going back to Plato's Republic that informs uh, the early modern Ottoman institution. And it's also reflected in uh, early modern Christian utopian literature like uh, Tommaso Campanella's City of the right. Sun um, and uh, uh, could come up with other examples. Um, but uh, uh, Leibniz's uh, appendix uh, to the Concilium Egyptiacum is not nearly as well thought out. Uh, and uh, again, its primary source uh, is a, a single treatise called Il Ottomano and also Thomas Pratt's History of the Canary Islands, um, where he's kind of um, pumped up on uh, the successes of the Spanish colonial empire and wants to encourage France to, um, to uh, duplicate this. Um, okay, and, and the other point was just, um, so uh, in some of the texts, I, I think there are very clear echoes of biblical passages in, uh, in the text you read. So for example, when you, and again, going back to the issue of, of religion. So in, in when you quote Paulist Voet, I mean, if, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So when he speaks about not returning a uh, escaped slave to their owners, that, that's you know, it's it's a verse. I mean, yeah. It, uh, you should not. Uh, uh, right. You should not return it. And similarly, when Leibniz is making this kind of claim that you cannot be a, uh, both a, a slave of God and a slave of a human being. Mm -hmm. Again, it's it's um, uh, so you know it's it's these passages where uh, you know for the children of Israel are my uh, are my slaves, but not the slaves of of, of uh, other human beings. So there is kind of a interesting line. I mean, I think the Bible in, on the issue of slavery is a mixed bag, but there is mm -hmm. a very interesting line where it seems that it is functioning that the Bible, biblical sources are also functioning as well, at least sometimes. Uh, elements of or critical of or, or, or the sources against, and I was wondering whether um, the whether the fact that in the Netherlands, uh, at least for some period of time, I don't know for how long. I mean, um, um, slavery was almost absent. Do you think mm -hmm. it has to do with there this kind of crazy or, or Calvinist? commitment to reading scripture literally or something of that so one last point uh, just again to put more, to put more support for your claim so when you're saying that slavery was not necessarily related to africa and the atlantic slave mm -hmm. i can just add one more word is that in medieval and early modern hebrew the word knan Mm. Not referring to the land of Canaan or Palestine is not referring to to is not referring to Africa. Canaan mm -hmm. uh, is the land of slaves, and it's a reference to the Slavic lands. Right, the right. Slavic right, lands right. are considered to be the areas where you where slaves are, and slavery is is basically the center. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. With so the, the paradigm of the slave being the Circassian, right? Absolutely, um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. I didn't know about that with the, with the the um, the Hebrew, um, but that's very interesting. Um, one interesting fact about, you know, I've uh, written quite a bit on Francois Bernier, who was a disciple of Pierre Gassendi, uh, who uh, in 1684 wrote uh, uh, what is supposedly the first kind of taxonomy of the different races called the Nouvelle Division de la Terre uh, in the Journal des Savants. And um, um, uh, Bernier starts by saying, you know, you've got your white people, you've got your black people, uh, but then uh, it's a weird little treatise because the, the, it's only four pages or so long and the final two and a half pages are about his own trip to a slave market in Constantinople and um, how uh, he himself admired the beauty of the Circassian slaves for sale, right? So even here in this uh, uh, supposedly foundational text of modern racial, racialized taxonomy, you still have Bernier in 1684 preoccupied with, again, this paradigmatic image of the, of the Eastern European as the, the um, 
the, the ideal slave. Yeah. But that's just an aside. Right, uh, we have a long list of questions now. Mm -hmm. Next is Karin Verhelst, and then Dan Garber. Mm -hmm. No, and then Juby Shank, sorry, and then Dan Garber. Karin, you need to turn on your mic. Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hello, thank you. For extremely, extremely, extremely interesting uh, presentation. I'm relatively new to this subject. So I'm not new to research in early modern period, of course, but uh, and not into Leibniz either, but I'm absolutely, how would I say, excited about this. I just have a small question with, the, with respect to the use of the word natural. And that's why I also asked, mm. what is the Greek term that Aristotle uses when he speaks about natural oh. slavery? And do we take enough into account that the word natural for ancient Greek means something rather different than in early modern period? Yeah. One thing, and a second thing, if you allow me to make life even more difficult, uh, <laughs> do we take enough into account that the vision that Aristotle has on the status of kinds of people, for instance, like mm -hmm. women, is not unproblematic either because clearly Plato has a different vision about this subject. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, sure. Yeah, and I mean, it, yeah, in a, a grand scheme, you could say that um, just like uh, 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 we've already invoked this kind of fascination with the institution of the Janissaries in, Ottoman Emp in the Ottoman Empire, and as Yitzhak pointed out, uh, that has some kind of affiliation uh, going back to um, Plato's Republic. You could say that in general, uh, in um, uh, radical uh, rethinking of the question of human equality in the modern period, um, there is, in, in a sense, a natural kind of uh, 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 tendency to uh, identify platonic filiations uh, and to reject um, uh, what in the early modern period was seen as the inegalitarianism of, um, of Aristotle. So that's absolutely right. Um, uh, I'm ashamed to say I don't know the Greek offhand. I think there's a footnote in my 2015 book uh, in which I give the Greek for natural slave, but I'm just completely blanking on that. So if anyone wants to jump in and tell us what it is, that would be very helpful. But I will say this, that whatever the Greek is, um, uh, uh, in when Aristotle says natural slave, uh, he doesn't mean the same thing by natural as what any modern will mean by natural. And I did say in my talk, that um, uh, uh, in the modern period, there is a renaturalization of the category of the slave, right? And I, I affirm that, I'll say it again, um, that what you have over the course of the 18th century um, is um, various attempts to reinscribe uh, human inequality into the order of nature um, by uh, various strategies for uh, uh, kind of peg pegging racial difference to uh, uh, positions in a hierarchy, right? Um, that is a naturalization that occurs, I would argue, um, uh, uh, mostly after uh, Leibniz and Tomasius and Capitain are uh, uh, saying what they have to say about slavery. Now, that renaturalization, uh, and this is just to say that I appreciate your point, um, that renaturalization cannot possibly be the same thing as what Aristotle had in mind when he invoked the idea of a natural slave, simply because Aristotle's idea of nature is one uh, that, um, uh, was formed independently of the work of people like uh, Linnaeus and Buffon uh, uh, and others who over the course of the 18th century uh, gave us a new and newly hierarchicalized vision of the natural order. Mm -hmm. So I'll just stop there. Going in the order in which the questions were received, it would follow Jibi Shank now and then Dan. 
but please let me remind you that if your question you think your question is precisely to the point just right finger in the, <laughs> in the chat and then we can reorganize the question so gv chang Great. Yes. Oh, hey, uh, I didn't see you. Oh, nice to see you there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is my uh, this is my basement in St. Paul here. So uh, yeah, no. <laughs> you'd be amazed what's underneath those bungalows in uh, St. Paul. But anyway, um, no, it's great to see you, Justin. And yeah. and again, just a shout out again to Dan and Dana. These wonderful these Zoom seminars I've been doing a lot of them are just wonderful, and it's great to come together. So yeah, it, it's um, your talk was was fascinating, and I have. Lots of kind of I'm, I'm, what I want to share with you is what I was thinking about, but I still am not sure if I've got a question um, and it um, comes out of I'm going to post into the chat a project that we have going at Minnesota centered around this book that comes out in 1721 or 23 multi volume work called the Ceremonie Écoutem Religieuse de tout le peuple du monde. And this has mm -hmm. been written about oh, by Lynn Hunt and uh, Margaret Jacob and Vanya Meinhardt as the book that changed Europe and is this kind of seen as pioneering uh, example of enlightenment, world history and and uh, an attempt to take stock in a in a tolerant way of the world's diversity in this way. And what work on this book has sort of pointed us towards uh, to particularly trying to think about a genealogy of it mm -hmm. is this convergence in the late 17th century around um, theology um, as it's sort of negotiating what might be described as the last gasps of the confessional mm -hmm. struggles mm -hmm. and, and its alliance then with scholarly erudition and jurisprudence where mm -hmm, the, the mm -hmm. two are coming together around and, and and I've also been just recently reading I you know it's 20 years old but I'm just getting to it now Pocock's account mm. of the enlightenment of Edward Gibbon in which he wants to situate Gibbon a figure of the you know who, who comes of age in the 1750s and 60s as a product of this, this like fusion of what he calls erudition and philosophy or erudition and enlightenment. And Gibbon himself is going back to these late 17th, early 18th century. Mm -hmm. and, and Pocock in particular has this de definition of enlightenment mm -hmm. in defined in this, in which it's about uh, an urge to try to, to remove confessional division through an idea of a, a kind of rational, natural, civil jurisprudence, right? Mm -hmm. And so I guess to come to your talk, I'm thinking about, you know, your, 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 your moment at the end where you're trying to situate Amo and Capitaine in terms of these discourses and things like this, what, what, what to make of them and that they're backward looking nature mm -hmm. and what that has to do with a sort of history of philosophy and I guess, and, and then the fact of the entanglement of their Christian uh, position, mm -hmm. that they're explicitly Christians and they're writing from an explicitly Christian point of view, even as they're also engaging in what we would call a kind of enlightenment. And, and just to suggest that it sounds like Hala, which I didn't mm -hmm. know much about in detail until I heard you talk, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think would be very fruitfully contextualized mm. as a kind of crossroad. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very much a Northern European centered mm. in, in the, the, the low countries in particular, but mm. with Germany and for Gibbon, it goes down to, he spends time in Lausanne mm. where so it's, this pro, it's very Protestant, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's, yeah. um, and, and I was particularly, you know, since I learned from Dan, 20 years ago or 15 years ago when you and I were with him in, oh, yeah. uh, yeah, in uh, yeah. Blacksburg to pay attention to when Leibniz is writing in Latin as opposed mm, to French. Sure. Yeah, 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 and yeah. I, I thought it was very interesting that that comment, you know, the things was, was French and was mm. he already in a way participating in this, what I guess I would proposit is a kind of late 17th century uh, disciplinary habitus mm. Yeah. That is bringing together what we now call philosophers, mm -hmm. uh, pure and simple, with people who are in law faculties, mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. are engaging in a kind of philosophical jurisprudence, but yeah. it's also 
historical and that all of that is saturated still with theology, but a yeah. theology that's becoming increasingly, um, uh, you know, naturalized, if not mm -hmm. proto secularized uh, yeah. in this way. Yeah. So maybe I'll well, just stop, stop there. That's sort of where my head's at. And I'm just yeah. curious your thoughts. So on. interesting. Thanks, JB. There's so much, so much to respond to there. Uh, and I'm having trouble seeing which, which part to bite off first. Uh, but, you know, one thing that uh, really strikes me about the Hala context is precisely as you describe it, it's, um, it's a crossroads of many, many things. For Leibniz in particular, what Leibniz had hoped uh, is that it would be the, um, the launch pad, so to speak, for a uh, Protestant uh, missionary project that would uh, duplicate and eventually exceed um, the Jesuit uh, project in Asia, right? And that's why Leibniz remains so close to the pietists, even though uh, we have this caricatural vision of the intellectual context of Halle, where you have the Leibnizian Wolf, who is the enemy of the pietists. In fact, Leibniz is interested in Halle as, so to speak, a portal to the world. And indeed, eventually, you have the Danish Halle mission to South Asia, and you have um, also the Halle orphanages opening up, as it were, branches, branch campuses in Moscow and Astrakhan, and eventually, with the opening of the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences, it's staffed after its opening in 1725 by largely Hala educated um, figures, right? So it's like um, the, um, again, the jumping off point to destinations east. And um, this is missionary and political at the same time. Now, this involves a kind of radical rethinking of the division of the faculties um, that is uh, very well illustrated, among other things, in Amo's own uh, intellectual trajectory. He starts out in law, he ends up in philosophy, and he's also a protege of Friedrich Hoffmann um, in the medical faculty at Halle, Hoffmann being Leibniz's um, great, uh, 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 sorry, um, peer in the battle against uh, the reactionary Georg Ernst Stahl, right? So there's a lot going on there, a lot of overlap between the faculties, freedom to move between the faculties um, and uh, to kind of contribute fruitfully in all of them, right? That's what Tomasius does, that's what Hoffmann does, and that's what Amo does. Um, now, I'll just say one more point about uh, uh, the importance of theology uh, in thinking about the early history of the idea of race. And this is all sort of there in my, in my 2015 book. Um, a, the, a picture of like the history of the idea of race and of racial hierarchy and racial inequality as it emerges over the modern period is complicated by the fact that properly understood a, a, a soul body dualism that was necessitated by, um, uh, pro, uh, by, by, by dogma um, was an important bulwark against full bore acceptance of racial inequality. Why is that? Well, as long as you're thinking of what it is that makes a human being a human being as something that is, so to speak, uh, uh, unsusceptible to categorization in terms of racial difference, then uh, it's hard to come up with a uh, kind of conceptual justification for the claim that different human groups are naturally unequal, right? Um, and so it's one of the things that I've been trying to do with my some of my work, including the 2015 book, is to show that in a sense, 
um, naturalization, or let's say uh, naturalized anthropology over the course of the 18th century um, is as against uh, theology an important kind of uh, force uh, for the emergence of, uh, of modern racial theory with all of its sin sinister connotations. But I'll, I'll stop there. Right, uh, Dan uh, Garber is next. Great, well, thank you very, very much, Justin, as usual for an exciting, interesting and engaging talk. Uh, my question is rather uh, more simple. Um, I was struck by the number of times in which you pointed out the difference between the conception of slavery um, that, you, that you find being discussed by your characters in, in the German universities. Mm -hmm the actual practice of um, slavery, the Atlantic, um, African slave trade, chattel slavery, both in North America and South America. And I'm wondering why. Is it a matter of the fact that in Germany, in, the, in this particular context, there was an intellectual tradition that was different from, say, Spain or England? or for that matter, the Netherlands? Or is it the difference between um, um, a sort of learned discussion within the universities mm -hmm. on the, and simply practices as they evolved um, in the slave trade? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, theory versus but, practice. Yeah, it's a really complicated question. And I really think that for different, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it remains a question mark for me, um, but I would say I can at least answer now that the answer is different for different characters. Um, and I really do think that um, when, for example, Tomasius is writing about uh, the kind of the question of um, whether Turkish prisoners of war who convert to Christianity uh, uh, need to be manumitted or not. Um, Tomasius is not avoiding the transatlantic slave trade. It's just that he lives in C Central Europe not long after the second siege of Vienna, and that's the reality he inhabits, right? There's, a, there, there's another pressing issue at hand besides uh, the emerging global slave economy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also one of the things that I've come to appreciate from reading law dissertations from Halle is the extreme importance, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this field, and of course there are excellent scholars who spend their lives working on this stuff, um, but uh, the extreme importance of determining within the context of early modern Holy Roman Empire, how, how much purchase uh, uh, Roman law has for the resolution of um, basic questions, like for example, whether, uh, whether wives can conduct household business, things like that. This is like looking at Roman law um, and in particular at the at Justinian's um, uh, uh, Codex Juris Civilis is the most important way of resolving a lot of really pressing issues, right? Um, so one can assume that Amo's lost legal dissertation did exactly this. What is my precise legal status here in Germany or the legal status of court moors in general, well, um, we turn to Justinian to determine the, uh, the, the question. And that seems strange to us, but it's a kind of, you know, it's, the, it's a comparable activity to, you know, studying the, the constitution for, uh, for, for resolution to questions about, you know, uh, em employment discrimination, <laughs> things like that, right? Um, uh, uh, so, I take it that that's not an evasion in those cases of the 
uh, of the much more important and much more familiar in a global scale uh, institution of transatlantic slavery, right? The, but then the question of Capitaine in particular, who is um, living um, in an important node of the global slave trade in Amsterdam and is in direct lifelong contact with um, slave traders as well, um, and is in a sense, in that sense, more kind of uh, uh, part of the Atlantic world than the Central European world. Um, for him, it's really hard to say uh, what uh, what the what the reason for the silence is, whether it's simply pragmatic, why he orients himself towards Hala um, as um, the kind of source of argumentative fuel uh, for his own position on slavery. Um, I think it's pragmatic, um, but it's hard to it's hard to do much more than speculate. Pragmatic in what sense? Uh, just that, I mean, he um, he finds probably finds it easier to talk about slavery uh, at a sufficient level of abstraction and distance to never have to say anything about the existence of the Dutch West Indies Company. Yeah, um, but this example. this this is exactly what it is that I'm wondering: the extent to which the discussion of slavery mm. becomes, you know, this abstract academic subject, mm, yeah. which is discussed within the context of um, academic standards about how it is that you go about addressing these questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you'll do and so on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it, it, that we definitely see that in Capitaine. Um, Though again, I think that in other figures, it might just be that they're that they're living in a different reality. You know, this is much later, but at some point, Blumenbach, in his 1775 um, uh, 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 on the innate variety of of, of the human uh, species, um, says, "Well, you know, over in the Caribbean, uh, they have all of these categories of human being like." quadroon and octoroon and maroon and all of this crazy stuff. And he says at some point, of course, those aren't real categories in Germany, right? They're um, context specific um, to the place where social reality is carved up in these ridiculous nuanced ways to accommodate the political inequality of slavery. And when Blumenbach says that, it's a, uh, it's a kind of a, an acknowledgement that the more you, you, the reality you live in uh, is distanced from um, the political reality of chattel slavery, the, the less salient its categories are going to be. So anyhow, I just bring that up because it shows, I think, um, the something particular about um, the position, the unique position over several decades, over the whole course of the 18th century um, of German scholars in particular uh, uh, in, the, in the way they look at the theoretical question of slavery and 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 the you know the categorization of human uh, human beings that it that it that it involves. But I'll, I'll stop there. Right. Thank, uh, thank you very much. We we do have a long list of questions. Let me try to kind of try to at least uh, introduce into the discussion some of them. So I think Enrico Passini is next. Oh, and, uh, hey, wow! Hi, Enrico. Ciao, Justin. <laughs> so nice to see you. You too. Yeah. So your your uh, your intelligent talk, notwithstanding, I as I wrote in the chat, I have a stupid question mm. uh, that is that's um, just an impression. But could it be that this uh, uh, reframing of slavery uh, as a boot camp? or as, uh, as some sort of welfare. So let's say the boot camp and the welfare theories of slavery, Leibniz and Capitaine, uh, have reflect in some way. So this reframing in terms of public policies, of 
public apparatuses uh, mm. of, of slavery reflect in some way the growing interest in the German public debate for the questions of polizei, of mm. public administration. Yeah. Uh, it's really a stupid question and, no. and a bit deflecting from from your interest but it's mm. a, it's something that uh, that resounds in that in this easiness to uh, think away problems when you reframe them in in terms of uh, of public organizations and it also uh, and and this you know very well since you have translated into english the writing uh, has connection with the uh, contemporary interest by the young Leibniz for the reorganization of the medical apparatus. Yeah, society. sure, yeah. yeah. So it's so, sort of uh, uh, um, easy way to think things for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, I mean, um, you know, Tomasius, the, the younger Tomasius is considered one of the, one of the key thinkers of German Polizeiwissenschaft, cameralism, um, as it was developing in uh, in the early 18th century. I don't know so much about this. I defer to the work of people like Andre Wakefield, um, who've written really really great stuff on on um, the origins of the the, the Polizeiwissenschaft. And uh, but I would say that certainly. Um, and it's you get a, a sense of this, even though it's much earlier in the in the passage from Duspec. Um, it's strange for us to think about um, uh, early modern reveries of the perfect institution as being also part of the history of slavery, because we tend to think of slavery as something that was obviously so abhorrent all along that everyone who was in, in, in implicated in it had to know it was dirty. It was it it was fouling, right? Um, but at the same time, as has now come up a couple of times, and as I think Yitzhak's comment earlier showed, um, there uh, is this parallel kind of utopian um, uh, 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 tradition where the uh, central figures are uh, slaves of a certain sort and the closest reality in which slaves of this sort uh, uh, ever uh, came into, you know, came into realization, even though it's mostly a utopian kind of fantasy, um, is in um, the Muslim world, in, in institutions like the Janissaries. And it's certainly possible that when the young Leibniz is himself fantasizing about, um, about uh, uh, these reformed institutions, like in this, this text you bring up from the same year, the Direcciones ad Rem Medicam Pertinentes of 1671, where he says that the medical establishment should be reformed along the lines of a, um, of a, of a religious order um, and doctors should be ordained and made to live in the same place. And, um, and you know, uh, uh, this is like the reverie about kidnapping a bunch of boys uh, and taking them to an island to learn martial arts. Both of these are these sort of um, uh, uh, backward looking, but also very contemporary um, uh, 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 projects of bringing into existence kind of ideal institutions, right? And Leibniz loved that kind of stuff, right? Um, and um, um, again, this has a precedent in utopian literature, and it is indeed also uh, part of the history of slavery in this much larger sense, which is a surprising discovery. Right. Thank I you, Enrico. I think Marlene uh, is next. Well, thank you. Hello, Justin. Nice to Hi, see Marlene. you. Hi, Marlene. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, I have uh, two, two connected questions. One of them was about the Dutch context. So um, I thought you were going to say about about your Dutch pronunciation. And I, oh. uh, <laughs> I mean, 
thinking that maybe we'd have to do a language lesson online sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's such a minefield in a different way from which English is. Right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I admire your bravery and uh, actually you've got Titan exactly right. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I've been working on that one. <laughs> um, so uh, I started out with the question, did the debate, did the discussion in, in the Netherlands uh, stay completely divorced from the slave trade? You already commented Capitain stayed out of that one. Mm -hmm. um, and then a similar historical contextual question is about Leibniz. Um, because Anton Yadza writes in her book that in the Concilium Aegyptanicum, mm. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, uh, he recommends to, he wants to convince Louis XIV to uh, invade Egypt rather mm -hmm. than the Netherlands. Which yeah. I have yeah. terrible memory for that, probably, of course. Um, and she places in the context of uh, Egypt being part of the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Leibniz wanted to direct Louis XIV to fight against the Muslims, but not against fellow Christians. Yeah. yeah. Although, of course, the Dutch were not fellow Catholics, by and large. But Leibniz, of course, was not concerned about, he wasn't so worried about Catholic. Right. Because right. of those two context issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah, so yeah. The, Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Whether that recommendation about invading Egypt, whether there's a connection with the addendum about the slavery. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, it's a fascinating text. And uh, I'm not sure whether Maria Rosa writes about this, but someone wrote uh, uh, an interesting speculation about what Louis XIV did with Leibniz's uh, draft. And it was possibly um, uh, filed away somewhere and then later retrieved by Napoleon. Um, I don't know if this is true, but uh, whether it's true or not, we do know that in effect, Napoleon uh, did take Leibniz's advice that had been a, a intended for Louis XIV. Um, and uh, that, in that, re in that respect, Leibniz is um, very, uh, 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 very visionary for better or worse. Um, uh, and it is exactly as Maria Rosa does say, um, something that's conceived by Leibniz um, as a, a, a part of his much broader Irenic project, right? Um, it is um, for the reunification of Christian Europe that Leibniz thinks a bit of imperialism might do some good, right? And, um, and imperialism slash um, return to the, 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 the Crusades. That's absolutely the, um, the rationale that he explicitly gives in the Concilium Aegyptiacum. And again, the addendum is just more of that, um, more ambitious um, because Leibniz thinks that um, Egypt is, so to speak, just the beginning. And again, if you look at the history of French imperialism, um, Leibniz is not wrong about that either. It just took, it took, uh, took a few hundred more years. Um, and indeed, uh, uh, France will uh, consider Madagascar an important sort of um, uh, 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 linchpin in uh, in its global empire, right? So, so Leibniz really is anticipating a lot of what will come to pass later on. Um, but again, uh, Leibniz is clearly thinking in the way he presents the addendum uh, to Louis XIV. I, I should say, by the way, that Louis XIV almost certainly never read this. It was like someone took these papers and said, oh yeah, thanks. We'll be sure to show these to the king um, and then filed them away. Um, uh, 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 Leibniz is clearly trying to convince uh, the French king um, that France can do what Spain already has done. That's the um, uh, basic argument. And that's why he's interested in colonizing an island off of, off of Africa. Um, and to a certain extent, you know, with Spain's um, kind of conquest of the Canary Islands, um, that's that's some what what Leibniz describes in the addendum actually is something that had come to pass in uh, 
uh, the history of Spanish imperialism already, right? Um, and so, um, so, so it is a, a, a wild fantasy, um, but it's also uh, something that, uh, that, that, that Leibniz is basing on historical reality. I'll just stop there. And, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, his strategy is one of um, bringing about uh, peace within Europe and a reconciliation of the divided church, yeah. So, I, I, think, I think Julia, sorry, uh, Julia Dorati. Oh, hey, yeah. Uh, next. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi, Julia, thanks for your article. It's really great. Um, thank you, and thank you for your talk. This was really interesting. Um, so my question is about Leibniz. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering about the relation that you see um, to exist between the um, early discussion of slavery in the Egyptian plan or the appendix to the Egyptian plan and then the late um, meditation on the common council of justice. Mm. Because you suggested, I think, if I understood you correctly, that you think that one connection is that the Ottoman context is relevant to both um, discussions. Mm. Um, I wanted to push back a little bit against yeah. um, the claim that the Ottoman context is relevant, at least to the late um, yeah. text meditation, um, because um, I think in that in that context, at least the way that Leibniz brings up slavery for the first time in that text, he explicitly ties that discussion to um, Thomas Hobbes and Robert Fulmer, so yeah. to the English the English context of uh, the discussions of slavery. And that context is kind of complex, but it has yeah. a lot to do with um, this, these debates over the power of kings over subjects and how much yeah. power can the king have. And then also it has to do with the natural law tradition and mm -hmm. this idea that there's natural liberty and natural equality. And this brings up theoretical questions about how much power anybody can have over other human beings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it doesn't, so that doesn't seem to, so tied to specific historical um, context, not not even the transatlantic context, mm. but also not the Ottoman context. I think it's yeah. it's more yeah. theoretical speculation about power and domination. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Thank you. No, I, I didn't mean to suggest that Leibniz remained narrowly interested in the Ottoman context uh, in the 1702 uh, Meditation. Um, uh, I, I hope I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't mean to say it if I did. Um, and I absolutely agree with you that the uh, meditation uh, is um, primarily focused on theoretical debates with English authors, in particular uh, uh, with Thomas Hobbes. And um, if there is any real world uh, example that he finds it worthwhile to draw on, it's, um, it's the um, American context. Um, but uh, again, that American context is so fantastical um, and so uh, uh, so detached from from the actual reality uh, of um, uh, of of indigenous peoples of the New World that um, that you could say that this is just pure thought experiment, right? And again, that's why Catalina Vermescu's book is so wonderful, The Intellectual History of Cannibalism, because it, um, it, it, you know, it shows the value as thought experiments of these things such as Leibniz invokes about the, 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 the Native American cannibal who eats all and only his own children, stuff like that. Um, um, so that's, that's the, the kind of, uh, kind of examples that Leibniz is drawing on, but he's not particularly interested in whether they exist in reality or not, which confirms your point that this is mostly a strictly theoretical text. And I absolutely agree with you. Uh, it's it, unlike the, the 1671 text, it's totally uh, separate from, um, uh, from uh, this interest in or consideration of um, Ottoman slavery. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Michael Rosenthal, next. Oh, hey, Michael. Hi. Hi, thanks very much for the talk. Maybe just following up on some of the other questions about mm -hmm. the Ottoman Empire. I've been reading 
um, Noel Malcolm's recent book on mm. the use of the Ottomans and political mm -hmm. thought in the early modern period and all the different mm -hmm. ways they were used. Mm -hmm. And so it came up in each of the different thinkers. And so I just wanted to maybe ask you to see whether you thought there was a pattern of use of Ottoman, um, of the Ottoman model in regard to the questions of slavery among these views, or are they each mm. really discreet and being used in a kind of more ad hoc way mm. um, in the discussion? Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to speak in general, and I think I know, I'm, I'm most confident in speaking about the case of Leibniz in particular, and um, this is something that comes up again and again in Leibniz's work. Um, it's uh, something that um, the scholar Ian Almond has written about very nicely, Leibniz and, and the Muslim world, I think it's called. Dan Cook also wrote about Leibniz and, and Islam. Um, um, so there's been a bit of this, but I think in Leibniz's work, if we take Leibniz as, um, as uh, paradigmatic for the early modern period, which is something we probably shouldn't do because he's always very original, um, but there are two different levels. And one is the immediate political reality that I've already invoked, the fact that um, uh, during Leibniz's lifetime, uh, Vienna almost became part of the Ottoman Empire. And if that had happened, then there's no reason why Halle and Berlin and Paris might not also have become part of the Ottoman Empire. And so, uh, you know, it was legitimately pretty close. And that means that um, that uh, that it's a constant presence in um, diplomatic uh, concerns, and Leibniz is, among other things, a diplomat, and he speaks about it in that register. Um, but it's also uh, uh, a um, uh, at the same time in parallel a sort of theoretical construct. Right, um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, it's often invoked more in the vein of a theoretical construct when it's taken as standing in for uh, the ancient world uh, with institutions that no longer exist in Europe. Right, that's. That's how it's often seen, right? Um, and it's very common in German discussions of slavery to uh, uh, speak of the Ottoman world and the Roman world practically as the same thing, right? Um, and then finally, and this is something that goes far beyond Leibniz, I just wanted to mention, and this is something um, Dwight Lewis and I have talked about a lot, and I know Dwight is very interested in this. Sorry, I just, I just now see Dwight and I wanted to say hi, is um, the uh, overlapping uh, early modern German categories for people uh, that um, often don't map on to our own categories. And one of those categories is Moor um, and another is Turk, right? Sometimes these are overlapping, sometimes they're separate but it's always certain that Turk is a very kind of um, capacious category that doesn't necessarily mean someone who is ethnically Turkish in the way that we use this today. So when it's being used uh, in that capacious way, it's almost like a, what's the term? A metonymy for um, uh, 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 the, um, the infidel as opposed to the heathen. If you want to think about, let's say, different cate ba basic anthropological categories in early modern Europe, you've got the, the Christian, then you've got the heathens of, say, uh, the Americas, but then you've got the Turks, right? Which is to say, people who uh, neighbor us, who share some of the same books and share some of the same philosophy, but are also, um, uh, uh, decidedly in the wrong, right? That's, that's the way the, 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 the term sometimes is, is invoked as well. Um, so, uh, uh, but again, this is uh, just kind of a, a very um, 
uh, uh, very kind of impressionistic um, uh, kind of survey of some of the different ways um, uh, the Ottoman Empire comes up in, um, in uh, early modern philosophy. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, I, very interesting. Uh, yeah. We are kind of approaching the end. We have five mm. more minutes. There are a lot of interesting points on the chat. We are going to save the chat and send it to you, Justin. Oh, cool, yeah. Uh, there yeah, was a, oh. there's a follow-up by Denise to Michael Rosenthal uh, uh, question, which I think, Denise, do you think you can develop that or shall we leave the last question for Pinka? Um, I can quick make the point. It's not, uh, it's just, there isn't one model of uh, slavery in the Ottoman Empire. Right. Uh, now, the Janissaries are rather uncharacteristic because they are taken as boys uh, from young age, eight, 10 uh, or so, from Christian families. Mm -hmm. uh, they um, converted to Islam and they uh, trained uh, communally um, and become an elite army, they are not, they are the closest army to the Sultan. So it's not just mm -hmm. some army yeah. that they formed, they formed one of the most important armies in the empire. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, they are uh, still slaves of some sort, but uh, mm -hmm. because of this uncharacteristic character, um, because they are uncharacteristic, uh, we cannot talk about the Ottoman model of slavery, focusing Fair on. Enough, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The majority is the house slaves of various sorts. Uh, the Circeat, the Kirklesian women uh, that were mentioned before are clearly in a very different category than these. And that kind of slavery goes on much longer, even after the gender series are over in oh, the century. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, but, yeah sure. Uh, when we say they're taking uh, a model, so they were, I also was reading Noel Malcolm's book. Uh, oh, yeah. On that, on this, these other kind of slaveries I don't remember much about, but the gender series were discussed uh, with respect to an author uh, called uh, what was Amiratov writing in 1598 and Campanella as well, mm -hmm. uh, not too much after that. Uh, and uh, the discussion in these uh, cases again, uh, again, were how does Europe resist the Ottoman Empire? Well, by forming uh, elites army of this sort from uh, young boys who don't have families. Uh, but it never comes, the, the issue of conversion never comes as far as it's reported here. I haven't read the sources, I don't know. Mm. But in Leibniz's case, mm -hmm. one can wonder whether uh, the, uh, he discusses, I don't know this, uh, whether the, the army will be a Christianized army. They, they're mm -hmm. made Christian in the same way as the, uh, the genitaries were made Christian. And whether yeah. this is the general model of slavery, uh, that it, this is the only way we will have slavery, this is the kind we'll have, or rather, well, this is one thing we can do to, well, have this uh, army that can fight all these wars, whereas I'm going to discuss the other kinds of slavery that might come up. But the, mm -hmm. at least this might be the position in 1671. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, all I can really say is thank you for that, that very interesting input. And, um, I, I, I really appreciate this further nuance. And certainly, um, yeah, Janissaries are not representative of Ottoman slavery in general. But, you know, the, the reason I emphasize that institution in particular is because it's what's on the mind of, uh, of European authors, such as Leibniz, paradigmatically, when they're talking about Ottoman slavery. Right. So um, thank you. Last question, very short, Pinka. Tinka, yeah. Oh, hi, Tinka. Hi, hi, Justin. Hey. Uh, I was wondering if Tomasius is somehow connecting um, his conception of slavery with his ethics. Mm. I don't know if we have time for this. Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. And the short answer is yes. Um, I, I mean, obviously, what he writes about um, uh, 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 Well, I mean, what he writes about the Koenig text um, uh, uh, on the question whether Turkish prisoners of war who convert need to be manumitted, um, that is uh, not necessarily representative or best representative of his um, uh, 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 
work for which he's known as um, an enlightenment tol uh, champion of toleration and uh, 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 so on. Um, but certainly in his work on uh, German feudal law, um, Tomasius uh, certainly does uh, kind of ground this. And, I was, I was uh, thinking about his ethical, ethics of love and you know this theory of enforceability. <laughs> Or yeah. To enforce this on people. No, it's not that close, maybe. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, I, I can't, I can't establish the direct connection, except that, you know, to say, to say that in general, I take Tomasius as someone who has a overall a unified project. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Right. I'm afraid we are kind of at the end of our meeting. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah. Two things. First of all, thank you, Justin. So yeah. if you want to switch on your mics, guys, and clap Justin a bit. Oh. Thank you very much. For the Whoa, talk. look at that. Yeah. <laughs> thank and you. last word, Dan Garber, who wants to announce something for next week. Um, I, <clears throat> I want to thank you all for coming today uh, and remind you that next week, uh, Carla Rita Palmarino from the Rabaud University in Nijmegen is going to be speaking about thought experiments in early modern science and philosophy. And of course, you're all welcome to come. Mm. Okay. So right. Thank you all. Yeah. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of